Hi, everyone. Oh, hello. Hey, Kelly, how are you? Doing great. Yeah, how are you all? So I'm excited to be here to have this discussion about DeFi. Um, I'm going to have each of you go around and introduce yourselves briefly and tell us a little bit um, about yourselves, starting with Greg. You want to go ahead and tell us who you are? Sure. Uh, Greg Keough. I'm a member of the DeFi Money Market Foundation, uh, or DMM as it's called for short. Um, very simply, what we're doing is we're using uh, real world assets to generate consistent yield uh, for digital asset holders. So if you hold ETH or USDC or USDT, you can get very consistent 6.25% yield off those digital assets. And the interesting thing is it's all backed up by real world assets that you can view on chain uh, using Chainlink's oracles. Awesome. Jonathan. Hey everyone, my name is Jonathan Lapczyk. I'm the CEO of Suku. We are a blockchain company out of Silicon Valley. And we focus on traceability as a way to accomplish two things. The first one is to help retailers and brands build more transparent products. And through that traceability is that we're accomplishing the second goal, which is giving access to financial tools to small participants in that traceability in the chain that they don't have access to in form of microloans using using uh, DeFi protocols. Excited to be here. Brian? Uh, hi, my name is Brian Norton. I'm COO of My Ether Wallet. My Ether Wallet is one of the first client-side interfaces for inter uh, interfacing with the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, we began in 2015. And um, since then, we've expanded our product offering to include user-centric user blockchain utilities such as wallets, mobile wallets, um, browser extension wallets, and uh, blockchain explorers um, for the average user. Last but not least, Aaron. Yeah, I'm uh, Aaron Grinhouse. I'm just a lawyer in Toronto. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <and> I, <laughs> Hey, we need lawyers. Started out in the space as an investor, and uh, you know, started playing around with this. Started learning about how smart contracts work, and started to realize that they will be the end of commercial lawyers at some point. So I, uh, I decided to look more into the technology, and I started representing ICOs early on. Uh, pivoted into the security space as well, uh, BTM operations, mining operations, crypto investment funds, and it all cum culminated into. Um, you know, two, a couple of years ago, uh, writing the first uh, legal textbook on blockchain law, a practical guide to blockchain smart contracts, and uh, parlayed that up more into, you know, lecturing at Osgood and creating co Well, I was a, a co director of the blockchain certificate program at Osgood as well. So, on the academic side, I've been very active in, in writing, uh, you know, articles and, uh, and advocating for the technology and representing clients in the real world. Awesome. So Brian, can you start us off by helping paint a picture here? Um, what is DeFi and why has it become such a transformative force in finance? Well, I think that first off, we, we, we kind of uh, DeFi or decentralized finance is something of a broad term to that can really be used to encompass most digital, most interactions you have with digital assets. Um, at the current state of the industry. I mean, the, the most atomic being just Bitcoin or Ethereum, those are, those are digital cash, those are the foundation of the, uh, the uh, decentralized finance ecosystem. Um, since, then, uh, since then, we have expanded out. Um, we, have, uh, uh, we have people working in uh, derivatives trading, uh, uh, money, uh, automated money markets, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, credit markets, and it's basically taking taking what are ex essentially uh, uh, financial primitives in the legacy system and putting them on the blockchain or other uh, distributed le uh, ledger networks, um, so that people can interact with them in a uh, permissionlessness, uh, permissionless, uh, decentralized uh, uh, fashion. So, uh, so what we're seeing, uh, so what we're seeing now, 
is sort of these, the first sort of wave of uh, experiments in this space um, sort of come to a head. Um, Uniswap, uh, Uniswap and other automated money markets um, and, and lending protocols. Uh, between those two, really, that's what we've seen explode over the course of the last year, year and a half. And that's where you see the bulk of this, what is, I think, now nearly $14 billion worth of assets um, currently locked. When To put that in context for anybody who doesn't know, we were celebrating $1 billion locked in DeFi um, in February of this year. Um, so... Uh, that's where we are. Uh, that's where we are. Um, 2020 hasn't been a great year in many uh, sectors, but um, the exponential growth in DeFi has been has been really, really remarkable. Um, Jonathan, what parts of traditional finance are most vulnerable for disruption, and in what ways could DeFi replace or overtake overtake some aspects of traditional finance markets? Great question. I think adding to what Brian was saying, how we got here, I think all of us got into the space with the promise of this banking the unbanked or giving more opportunities mm -hmm. for people that didn't have access to financial tools at the time. And that's why we got into Bitcoin 10 years ago and with the idea of becoming your own bank. So I, I always say that that gave us the opportunity to store Bitcoin, put it on our closet and then I have a savings account that I don't need to pay anyone, that I don't need to send any onboarding papers and nobody is controlling me. And that was the first service of decentralized finance. Now we call it DeFi. Now there's like, we decided to group it because I think we're closer to the vision. And, but decentralized finance was exactly the same thing we were doing 10 years ago. And now with smart contracts and with the advancements of different technologies, now we're expanding those services. It's just not like custody. It's now it's lending and now I can invest. And now I can do other things that you sh like typical banks do, but providing that service um, for every user and removing the intermediary. So when we look at the parts that the traditional finance are most vulnerable to disruption, I think we need to think about the ones that provide the least value, one, two, the more friction with user users and three the ones that have limited access to users value around the ones that there's a lot of costs added by intermediaries and the one that really le offer least the least value for for the customer like a savings account and then the friction how, how easy it is to get on board how easy it is to start using the services and the ones that really don't and it's difficult to give access to small participants and, and in the individuals that don't have access to lending and, and other services. Um, so I think when we took at the challenges, when we look at where we went from that time with, with Bitcoin to today, I think the, the first three pieces around custody, lending and investments, I think those are the first three ones that are going to be disrupting and they're already disrupting traditional financial markets. So, Greg, Jonathan talked a bit about this, um, and I know it's something you're passionate about. One complaint about traditional capital markets is that only a handful of people really benefit. And how is DeFi more inclusive and how transformative will this be for the global financial system? Yeah, I think our, our financial system is, is kind of broken, right? And I, that I come from actually, uh, I've been a fintech entrepreneur for a long time, but I've also run, uh, was a CEO for a joint venture between MasterCard and Telefonic for mobile financial services globally. So I understand the traditional system. And unfortunately, I think everybody here talking, if you have Bitcoin, you already know it's broken, right? So I think there's kind of three three legs to the, the stool that, that is the big financial problem we have globally. So the first is fiat debasement. This one I won't spend much time on because pretty much everybody understands and it's gotten so much worse in the last six months or eight months with COVID, right? So the spending is out of control. The fiat's being debased incredibly. The second is the lack of yield, right? So there's $14 trillion in negative yielding debt globally. Um, and I believe that trend is going to accelerate further. Then I think the third leg of the pyramid is while interest rates are at zero for folks in the financial system like banks, and there's just in the U.S. about a trillion dollars in credit card debt, Guess what the rates are for credit card debt? Have they went down? 
banks certainly are getting capital cheaper than ever. No, they're still about 15, 18%, right? I think you're average about 15 and a half percent. So the big question is why? And so the real reason is those three factors to me show a very broken financial system. And the real problem is for a normal person, think about it. So if you're just working away, you know, every, every day working, uh, trying to make your money, the money you're given is worth less every day. But even the little bit you might be able to save, you put into the bank and you get no interest. And then the third thing is if you actually want capital to expand your business, you don't actually get any benefits out of the current system. You're still charged the 15%. So it's a totally broken financial system. So in, in the DeFi money market uh, ecosystem, we've tried to solve that by using, you know, uh, combining real world assets with digital assets, providing yield, but building it within a, an infrastructure of a fixed uh, quantity of tokens that are constantly being burned because excess yield is burned. And so it was an idea was how could you try to solve in our small section of the world, uh, this type of problem. And I think that until I think the people, uh, the young people today are very, very cognizant of this problem. And I think that there's going to be large political and economic global impact of this. And DeFi is at the corner store of a uh, cornerstone of it, in my opinion. Um, Aaron, do you think that we will see traditional finance markets adopt any aspect of decentralized governance models that we've seen with DeFi start to emerge? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna approach this from a fun regulatory angle. Uh, one of the things uh, I think people tout about DeFi is how it gives access to better investments that only rich people would normally get. Uh, when in reality, you know, rich people, otherwise known as accredited investors, get access to these higher yield investments because their risk tolerance is higher, uh, so they can bear the loss of a riskier investment. So, like the securities regime is really to blame for limiting access to these investments, not the financial institutions, I don't think, uh, because it's set up to protect the common, so to speak, common investor by limiting their access to higher yield, but riskier investments. So what we need to see, if you wanna proliferate these types of investments, whether it be through DeFi or otherwise, uh, in smaller amounts, is a change in regulation which sets minimum investment amounts uh, a little bit lower so that other people can participate in them. Typically, accredited investors have to put in a certain specific amount to be able to participate in these. And when you say, uh, also I should say, you know, when you say traditional markets, uh, it also depends on which markets you're talking about. Because DeFi, uh, like I think it was Greg who said earlier, is really a myriad of financial services, not just one thing. It comes from lending platforms to insurance, to all kinds of things. In a way, actually, DeFi is really everything that blockchain technology was created to accomplish. Uh, syndication through anonymous sources using, without intermediaries, uh, using smart contracts. So um, it's really the antithesis of existing of the existing regime uh, of centralized monolithic financial institutions. So what will likely happen is what has already happened uh, over the last 10 years, which is that these large institutions will start you know, patenting and shelving parts of the technology as much as they can, and then uh, to eliminate that competition, and then internally adopt as much of it as it can through its own nodes and its own internal system uh, to create efficiency the way that businesses do. Um, Jonathan, as much um, as transformative of, as DeFi is, there's definitely been some problem areas what are some of the biggest challenges and problems in DeFi right now in your view? Yeah, I would summarize it in three main challenges. The first one is around sustainability. The second one is on trust. And the third one is around simplicity and UX. Sustainability, not environmental sustainability, but is this sustainable from a strategy perspective on the flow of capital the flow that we are getting, the, the leads, the, the, the total uh, locked value. When we look at what, what happened in the last few months, we've seen this circle of crypto people mainly in this bubble that we live in, just adding assets and collateralizing assets to get another asset. And that asset will give them access to collateralizing other assets to give them another asset, which we went through these experiments that they are fascinating for innovation, but it's not sustainable. I, I mean, do we think we're gonna get like 500% five, five, um, 
yield every year for the rest of our lives? No, probably it's a bubble. We are experimenting and that's, that's great. So the, we, we will need to find at some point real users. Like this is, we are the users, that's great. We are using the capital to do something maybe uh, to, to, to get more leverage. But we need to build a bridge with the real users. And I think that's, that's, that's a huge problem. At Suku, we are trying to resolve that. And some others, some, some people will say that we don't need to bring DeFi to the masses, that we are going to be good here in this bubble for, forever. It happens that with our work around traceability and working with products and brands, we have access to networks of suppliers and small participants the same participants, the same individuals that really need access to all these things. They don't have IDs, they don't have a banking, they never had a microloan. So we are using the system that we created, which originally was more focused at the beginning, more for a centralized uh, finance because there weren't um, these, these, these tools. But the idea is to provide them microloans in form um, in connecting with them with the DeFi protocols. And that's a sustainable strategy. We find and we, we have found a network of people that really need it and we're bringing them on board to create a bridge with DeFi. So creating a sustainable strategy, I think it's key. The second one is around trust in the code. That's nothing new. We've seen everything that happened with unaudited code, with uh, code being tested in production. So that's, that's something that we will need to address. Um, which I'm sure um, it's not going to be that difficult if we, if we set the right process to, to go through it and set up a long-term um, strategy for that. And then third is around simplicity and UX and access. Like it's, it's still too hard, but I mean, it's, it's part of the experiment, right? It's still too hard to use DeFi tools. So I think we need to build, we need to work on these tools that, that make it easy to onboard someone that doesn't have any idea of what's Uniswap, um, what's a collateral, what's Aave, and give them access to it without them knowing. So we, we're gonna be sharing um, in, in a few days something that we created to address that problem that it's a, it's a strong focus for, for us at Suku. Awesome. Um, Brian, DeFi hacks have nearly comprised half of all crypto hacks this year, including the $281 million hack uh, for, of Qcoin um, that was laundered through DeFi protocols. What should be done differently to guard against hacks and DeFi protocols being used to launder money? Um, well, there's a couple of th uh, things that play there, like particularly like with the Qcoin uh, uh, hack. Uh, I, I think it should be noted that Qcoin hack was, that's, that, that wasn't a, 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 a hack of a decentralized finance protocol that was a, a hack on uh, mm -hmm. a centralized exchange um, where private keys were, were leaked and, um, and assets were taken, um, which, uh, and uh, the, the role that DeFi played in that is actually in the attempts by the, the hackers to obscure and, 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 like you said, launder those funds. Um, but actually, so it was, so it actually, it kind of draws into attention that what we actually need is more decentralization in the crypto space rather than less because uh, what happened, what happened there was centralized points of failures were exploited and then mm -hmm. brought into the decentralized space where hackers were able to move freely. Um, and so had, uh, had that, uh, had that not been the case, the hackers wouldn't have had the opportunities that they had. Um, I should say that that it seems KuCoin claims that they have been able to recover all but fifteen million of those of those funds. Um, I can't I can't independently verify that, but that's what they that's what they've claimed. Um, I think that um, from the um, I, I think what Yoni said, uh, Jonathan said, was uh, is uh, is really important. These are experiments. DeFi uh, DeFi protocols are still experiments. We're very much in that space. It's 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 DeFi it's DeFi protocols issuing assets that to be locked in other DeFi protocols that are turning like that are distributing yield in in tokens that are then again locked in other uh, DeFi pro protocols. So the 
the we, we do, the first thing, uh, what we need to do is move out of this experimental phase into something resembling sustainability. But the um, the fact that that assets are able to move, liquidity is able to move freely and permissionlessly. Uh, people need to understand that these are not uh, that that that's not a bug. That's a feature. That's that's what these things are for. And it really is, uh, but what it does is it creates, it creates a market for investigators and regulators uh, uh, for creating tools for those. Chain analysis is one of those, is like working with, um, working, with uh, uh, working on creating tools um, for regulators and, compli uh, 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 and compliance officers in order to be able to uh, to track these assets in an, in an efficient way. And so um, uh, it's going to, it really is going to take the market to respond in order for, uh, uh, for these uh, uh, checks to be able to be, uh, be put up, placed upon those who would exploit DeFi protocols or hack centralized exchanges um, because, uh, because the, um, uh, the like the the ecosystem is just designed to behave this way, and uh, and so that's that's really where we're going to be. And I would I would encourage people who are coming into this space who are not have previously educated on it to to remind to remember that despite the high yields, <laughs> like uh, the hype over high yields, um, market fundamentals are not left at the door just because we're talking about digital assets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you are, if you're putting your your assets into an unaudited smart contract uh, protocol that was spun up, uh, that that was spun up a week ago, you know, you know, adjust your your, your risk assessment accordingly. <laughs> that uh, um, that it's uh, that's all there is to it. You wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't throw your life savings behind a company that you had never heard of uh, uh you know well maybe you would i don't know <laughs> um but i mean i mean it's the pen, it's the penny stocks of yesteryear you know if some if your broker calls you up and says that you got to get in on this thing well you know proceed at your own peril and uh and so in some in some ways these things are not new. Where it is, where it is new, is that you're talking about liquid asset. You're talking about liquid assets that are unrecoverable if you lose them. So, mm -hmm. do your research. Do your research and know what you're getting into. Um, from an, from an ecosystem perspective, is like we have to build products to put checks on these uh, 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 on these things, and we're still in the experimental phase. Can I add one thing, Kelly? Uh, yeah. It's a question for, for everyone I know. Greg went through the same thing. We went through uh, the hack uh, with Kuken as well. And if there's one thing that I kept asking myself during everything that was happening was, is there anything else that we could have done differently from a decentralized uh, perspective, um, from a governance perspective? We all agree and we all know the truth. We all know that everyone agreed that we saw the hacker's wallet and we saw that the hackers shouldn't have been selling on decentralized exchanges. And still, we couldn't do anything. I, personally, I reached out to Hayden, I reached out to Abe and said, hey, is there anything that we, I don't know, vote or agree that this is wrong? Like the hackers shouldn't have decentralized exchanges as a way to go out. And that's still decentralized, but we all agree that's, that that's true. And I think we should have the tools to make that happen. And uh, it's still, still early, but I think it's a great lesson learned, at least for us. Uh, I, I just to add in, I think that would be great. I do think one point of notice, though, what was hacked was a centralized exchange, not a decentralized exchange, right? Yeah, so it exactly. shows you the great mm -hmm. benefit of mass adoption of decentralized exchanges. Yeah, yeah really okay. interesting point. And I know this is close to home for <laughs> Greg and Jonathan. Um, Aaron, should DeFi protocols be required to meet the same compliance standards as centralized exchanges? And given their decentralized design, is that even possible? I think the second part is 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 a harder question, but I I think um, what people often forget is that securities enforcement regimes are all built around disclosure, and the fundamental premise 
is that the common person will likely be swindled by smooth talking, snail, snake oil, sales people or whatever, or big bad corporations who will convince them to put their small retirement savings into something that ends up being a scam. Greg asked a good question when he was, he said, would you, would you put your money into some company that was just created a week ago? And my answer to that is depends how good their advertising is, because I, I can tell you that a lot of people do every day because they get sold. So if you get sold, the problem is um, the government has set up institutions. They've realized that this is happening and they've set up institutions to try and protect that. And that's what the securities regulators are. It's just about disclosure. The securities regulators are here to make sure that people know what they are buying into rather than just, now I'm not an advocate, like I don't work for the government. Okay, I'm a private practice lawyer, but I have to, I have to understand when I'm looking at these things, that you know, if you're if you're gonna buy into something, and you've got regulators, or if you're if you're trying to go public, we're trying to do an ICO like people clients of ours did in 2017, like crazy, and the securities regulators were running around in circles trying to figure out what is going on. The fundamental premise here is just that you you should provide disclosure about what you're selling to sufficient to allow people to make an intelligent decision because that wasn't happening and when it doesn't happen. So whenever the public is really be, whenever the public is being solicited for investment, these regulations apply. So regardless of the method of investment or fund collection or the type of value being invested, whether it be cash or crypto, people need to know what they're investing in. I think we can all agree that the market will be a lot healthier without scams, but who's there to, to stand in the way of the scams? So, this is where the regulators jump in and just like marketplace regulation with crypto exchanges, just like uh, the pride of Canada, Quadriga, uh, that taught us all a, less, a couple, a few lessons, several lessons about how, you know, they can be used as Ponzi schemes, how they can be, how private wallets can be abused, how all kinds of things we learned from the implosion of Quadriga and what happened there. Obviously, if the marketplace is totally decentralized, there is a huge risk in that the proper protections are not there. So it's really a free market with buyer beware, caveat emptor, just buyer beware being the only protection. So you might want to say, okay, fine, use your common sense. But at a point, your common sense gets skewed with all the inundation, being inundated with so much information and uh, that may or may not be accurate. So I think that the rules as they exist uh, now are struggling to keep up with this. I don't know how it's going to evolve or how it's going to develop. We, we do have uh, very, very, uh, I think that the tax in for people are way ahead of the security people here. Uh, the, the tax, uh, the revenue agencies and those, those regulators have uh, a lot more um, process in, in place. But when it comes to decentralized exchanges, it's going to be a challenge to enforce those things. And it's going to be risky for people to invest in them for a while. Um, I, go for it, Brian. I, I just wanted to add a, 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 on a little bit there um, uh, about the possibility aspect of it. Um, one of the things that people, uh, you know, some people don't realize is that you know because there is no centralized control of these things, um, they they and so much of it is, is built uh, upon a, open source software that really anybody can pick up the mantle and make these things run you know you you know it's you know i i i don't want to make, make it sound nefarious or anything like that but it's you know you chop off the head of one thing and you know another one two you know five more heads spot, uh, sprout up um you know most of these uh, most of these things can be spun up independently of the people who are maintaining them now which is going to make it much uh, like poses just another challenge for regulators to try to like tamp down on the uh, uh, on this. Yeah, and just just to a quick uh, that was a good point of distinction from Brian. And by the way, I think I credited Greg with some of Brian's uh, comments earlier, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but uh, okay. I you know uh, I think that there's an important distinction here uh, to be made between exchanges and the things actually being traded on those exchanges. So while a decentralized exchange may be virtually impossible to regulate, 
if something being sold on those exchanges ends up being uh, a scam, then you know it's, there's there's a much there's there has been there's been a lot of enforcement of, of those. So it like we're really trying. I think the regulators are really trying to figure out what the best approach is to enforcement, not just trying to apply the traditional rules because clearly they won't they don't work anymore. We have to we have to I mean, they they have to think of uh, of of more creative ways of of enforcing and they're doing everything they can. Um, Greg, as was pointed out in the beginning by Brian, I mean, this this is a huge market that's grown significantly over the course of this year from one to, I think, now 14 billion locked into DeFi protocols and over half a million DeFi users, which is mind boggling to me. How do you think DeFi is going to grow and evolve over the course of this next year? Yeah, I think one of the things to kind of pick up the thread from the, the, the last question, actually, those DeFi actually provide with a great opportunity for transparency into financial assets. Um, so if you look at how traditional like uh, loan packages are traded on Wall Street, generally, you can see very high level details and maybe some credit uh, rating over the different tranches. But you actually can't see the, the specific assets, what they exactly are being each tranche. And that's part of the reason the mortgage crisis exists and almost collapsed the economy that, that when they scratched back, they saw a lot of that wasn't there. So I think DeFi does provide us the opportunity to provide that level of transparency. We do it in DMM with you can actually see the exact physical assets, the liens, everything behind it, the valuation from third parties that's producing this yield. So I think it, DeFi is uh, provides us opportunities basically to make things better and more transparent. Uh, for folks. I think the system and DeFi itself will continue to grow like exponentially. Um, and I do believe one of the key elements that we will get is, again, there's, you know, probably $90 trillion in readily available money uh, worldwide. I'm not talking about structured debt and other things, but just cash more or less in different forms. Uh, and none of it's getting any yield. So I definitely think yield is one of the key components that has a, a strong incentive for adoption either on the retail level or on the in, uh, institutional level, right? So if you're getting 0% yield, uh, that's probably not ideal for a lot of people who are under in the business of managing money who must produce yield to show their value. So I think what we're going to see is, uh, but with that said, DeFi is still way too complex, right? So the average person cannot cannot do it. Uh, you know, uh, it's just the reality. And it reminds me a lot of the internet at the early days, except the technology is much, much, much more complicated. Uh, but with that said, there's people, as others have stated here, building things to make this easier for folks. Um, you know, we work with uh, Tim Draper and, and those guys, and they're, they're, they're uh, involved in the foundation as is Collaborative Ventures and others. But they're working on something called Reserve, which basically allows you to convert fiat into DMM and earn interest in a very like easy way that anybody can click on, has custody, everything else. And so I think people are going to start to be building more and more around different protocols that can produce yield. And I'm not saying they're going to put their entire portfolio in there, but I do see that we're going to see it much like Bitcoin. You know, if you go back five, six years, Bitcoin was, uh, you know, a scam or whatever. Yes, JP Morgan, but now JP Morgan has their own coin. Uh, and also it suggests that you have a certain amount in gold and Bitcoin, which is quite interesting. Uh, so I think that you're going to see things being built actually that provide you with different ways to generate yield. And they're going to be suggested in traditional folks as part of your portfolio. So it might be like, okay, you may leave uh, some in a hedge fund and maybe you get 3%. Uh, but maybe you should take, you know, three or four percent and put it into some sort of DeFi platform or, or a combination of DeFi platforms that are producing interest. You have a little, and perhaps a little bit more risky, uh, even though I would argue it's probably less risky. But uh, I think that that's these are the things we're going to see. And this is going to start to drive much, much larger growth, because I think the core thing and the root problem that DeFi solves is, again, this global problem that I mentioned at the beginning. It's large, it's everywhere, all consumers are impacted by it, all businesses are impacted by it, governments are impacted by it, but they're net beneficiaries. Um, so I think this is a very, very large shift in the way the world's gonna work uh, going forward and DeFi will be a big part of it. Awesome, so rapid fire round for the final question um, and then I'm not sure if we'll have time for audience questions, but what is your futurist prediction by August, 2021? And I'm gonna go around and uh, you each can answer that question. So Jonathan, you wanna lead off? A big bank uh, fully decentralizing one uh, department uh, with services maybe providing support for those services that fully decentralizing maybe lending, insurance um, or any other services they offer today. Brian? 
I think that this time next year or by August of next year, we'll see DeFi, the amount of total locked value locked, uh, uh, increase exponentially into the hundreds of billions. And I think that we're going to be talking about how to deal with all of these dis un uh, uh, uncollateralized loans that are being distributed. Like that's going to be the next big, uh, the big question that we're going, we're going to tackle, uh, tackle is like, uh, in DeFi. Moving from co a collateralization, over collateralization into zero collateral. Aaron. Yeah, I think DeFi will probably be adopted in some form as an evolution of crowdfunding with institutions and investors uh, determining the risk appetite. And Greg? I think you'll see uh, DeFi with hundreds of billions locked up. I think you'll have the beginnings of institutional people coming in. I think part of them will do it in kind of this a new type of fund that'll be directly uh, focused on providing yield through this manner. Um, and then I will add, I think you'll see ETH at about uh, 4000 over $4,000. I think you'll see BTC at over 75000 Those are the fun predictions. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm not sure if we have any audience questions. I don't see any. Um, anything you guys want to add while we're still live? Oh, thank you, Kelly. And thank you, the entire team. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you yes, guys thank you all, all for taking the time today and great, great insight. And looking forward to seeing what this next this next year holds for us.